I've been participating in these discussions as I think have, well, maybe not all my colleagues, but some of my colleagues for nearly a quarter of a century now, and have, as Rebecca and uh, Kathy indicated, seen enormous gains in the area of girls' education, gender equality more broadly. Um, some of these gains, as we've been hearing, I think have, uh, have brought real advantage in the area of development, both at national levels and at community levels, but they also seem to be uh, raising or underscoring new problems. I mean, succeeding in primary school, getting more girls enrolled and going through primary school, uh, face, uh, brings us up to the challenge of finding equality now in enrollment and attendance in secondary, post-primary school. Success in primary school butts up against the challenges of finding equality in the workplace and in broader society, not just in the economic sphere, but in the social and even family spheres in many, in many countries, many places around the world. Um, I think it was Kathy who said that Parents around the world, with exceptions of course, but parents around the world want the best for all their children, their daughters and their sons. And the challenge they face is not whether to educate their children, but whether to educate them in formal schooling settings. Recognizing that formal schooling settings in many situations do not provide the quality, I'm not telling anybody in this audience anything that they don't already know, do not provide the quality, and as the ambassador was illustrating, um, I think she was measuring her words carefully because a lot of what she hears about is very shocking and distressing, um, it brings real jeopardy to the girls attending these schools. So the successes that we're finding, we're now dealing with very different sorts of issues. Um, the ambassador also made the point that was something that I frequently say, not all education problems have education solutions. And we need to look well beyond schools, and I think especially beyond schools for some of the issues that we're dealing with these days, thinking most prominently about the, uh, what I'm seeing more and more as a war on young women that we confront around the world. And how do we engage people in this battle? We have up here today with us today three colleagues um, who, have, I think, I believe, hopeful stories to share with us about how we engage in this battle um, to bring dignity and accomplishment to girls, young women around the globe, and to provide this, the, their families and the communities in which they live with the evidence, not the sorts of numbers that we would like to talk about here when we're sitting at Brookings, but the evidence that they need at the family level to demonstrate that sending my daughter to school is not going to lead her to perdition, but is rather going to provide her, her family, her community opportunities that do not exist right now when we're not having, giving girls proper opportunities to be educated in the formal sphere as well as in the, in the formal academic sphere as well as in the non-formal cultural, social, family spheres. So, um, I'm going to stop talking. We'll, I'll introduce my, the panelists one by one, um, beginning with, uh, I mean, let them speak and then introduce the next panelist, just in case you don't remember who I talked about the second time. Um, we'll start with Sally Gear. Sally Gear. Sally is a senior education advisor at DFID, the UK Department for International Development, and has been policy lead for the UK government's work on girls' education since 2009. She currently managed the UK flagship, or manages, the UK flagship, right? Manages still? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Resignation in her voice. Uh, the flagship girls' education challenge, a remarkable, this isn't in writing, but I'm saying it's remarkable, 355 million pound global fund targeted specifically at improving girls' schooling, especially for marginalized girls around the globe. Sally has worked as regional education advisor for Sub-Saharan Africa for the British Council on Gender and education advisor for the international NGO Voluntary Services Overseas, VSO. 
Um, Sally, Lucy, and Aaron all are much more than what's written on the paper. They're very passionate, um, eloquent, and energetic advocates for the issue of girls' schooling, and it's a real pleasure to be here with all three of you. And you'll see why I say that in just a second. <laughs> Sally, it's yours. Um, <laughs> I, just, <laughs> pressure. Um, just a quick question to get you started. DFID's making really prodigious strides and as a leader, I think, among the many international organizations, or international donors, uh, moving us towards evidence in girls' schooling and in education more generally. And I know you're still at the beginning of a lot of these efforts, but if you could talk a little bit about what you're learning at this stage and um, looking forward, because as I say, you're still at the beginning, or toward, closer to the beginning, what are you trying to learn? Uh, about girls' education and about education more generally. Great. Thank you, Josh, and thank you for that nice welcome. Um, I just think I want to start by, by saying that the UK government really prioritises women and girls. Um, and so for me, without my civil servant hat on, having worked in these areas, it's a very much a carpe diem moment for us. So this is a real opportunity, I think, to make some real transformative change. So it's a privilege to be part of the girls' education efforts of the UK government at the moment. Um, I just want to talk briefly on a couple of things, if that's OK, Josh. The first, the first is around some work that our research division actually led. And, and I'm delighted to be on the panel with Erin, because she was one of the consultants who took part in this piece of work. Um, it was a rigorous literature review. That always begs the question, what a non-rigorous literature <laughs> review is. But uh, I'm sure it was very rigorous. Um, and it involves looking at a lot of uh, hours and hours, I'm sure, of all the research that we have, existing research on girls' education and gender equality in particular. So very much looking at the linkages between what girls' education actually delivers for girls, because I think it, we can't assume necessarily that it's an, it, it's an empowering experience, as we know. So, um, so we have the result of that. We have the, the literature review, um, which I think is published now, or about to be published, um, and an evidence brief, which will be available publicly in a couple of days, which I'll be able to circulate to anyone here afterwards. So we haven't really got time to go into the detail of it, but I think a, a couple of things, I think, that I wanted just to highlight from that, which, um, and Erin, please do jump in. Um, first of all, I think it's got a very useful... Um, theory of change for those of you, and I'm sure there are some in the audience who are still sort of researching and thinking about these issues. And, and um, we love these theories of changes in DFID at the moment, <laughs> but I, I think they're quite a good discipline to really test practitioners also on interventions and assumptions that are made behind those interventions on what works. So um, there's a really, I think, a very useful um, look at um, the various types of interventions we've been doing over the years on girls' education and what they've actually delivered and what the assumptions we make behind the evidence that has shown that. So I think that's something that I would really recommend you take a look at um, and, and, and look at in more depth in terms of thinking about your work either as, as a researcher or, or a practitioner. Um, but in terms of the key findings, I think I'd just like to share sort of two or three of those. Um, the first, and, and all of these I think aren't surprising, but it's good to get a little bit of a sense of how much evidence we've actually got. The first one is around teacher training um, and women in leadership. There's really sort of promising finding that these things really matter to make girls' education empowering. So it's not just an experience, it's an empowering experience. So I think that speaks to the work that Brookings and others are doing on women's leadership particularly in the education sector. At the second, and I'll talk about this a bit more when we go on to the Girls' Education Challenge, on um, that st stipends and cash transfers and all these things do matter. They do matter to access, and they do get girls into school, because basic economics is one of the reasons why girls aren't going to school. There's other things that are important, but poverty matters. However, there's less evidence on what happens once girls are in the classroom and whether that will lead to improved learning outcomes. So that's saying this is not enough and maybe speaking to something the ambassador was saying earlier also. Um, on, on infrastructure, infrastructure and schooling, um, having good buildings, those sorts of things do matter in terms of the evidence. But separate toilets, which has been something that we've talked about a lot, we need to know more about whether the real impact of those. It, again, it seems to be 
that, that, that these are things that are important but nowhere near enough to make sure girls have an empowering experience in school. So um, I think that's just a little flavour of the sorts of things you'll pick up if you really take a deeper dive into this, this, this piece of work that's been initiated from our research department. So please do look at it and, and follow up with us um, if you need to find um, any more. And thanks to Erin and her colleagues. Erin, um, do you want to add anything on... I think I'll, in some ways, pick up where you left off in terms okay. of what, what do, else do we need to learn about how to make the educational experience empowering. But it was Elaine Unterhalter also at the um, um, uh, Institute of Education at the University of London that led the, the team. And so um, I think it was a wonderful uh, multidisciplinary and collaborative effort that led to, to this. And so it was, um, I think it will be a useful tool for uh, defining a future agenda. Great. Thanks, Erin. Just a couple of minutes on the girls' education challenge. Yes, you've, am I got, okay? you've got three. I've got three. Okay. <laughs> so, um, just again, um, so the girls' education challenge, which we've spoken about and and which I still manage, um, is um, is now at a stage where we've got the baseline findings from the 37 projects that we've we're sponsoring over 20 countries. Um, we're we're tracking over 40,000 girls um, in each of these programs. So we have cohorts of girls that we're following, and we have interviewed these. Girls girls for a couple of hours each actually so we know a lot about 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 them and I'm hoping this is going to really help us understand not only some very quantitative hard data which is important but some real qualitative work on, on the real experience of of being in school so um, just very early findings if I may just to give you a snapshot um, Again, poverty has come out really strongly um, that um, this is the main reason. And actually what we found was in many of our countries, parents were actually very supportive. They said they were very supportive of girls' education. However, as soon as the trade-offs came in, and for example, household chores of up to six hours in one case, or where the fees were prohibitive, then the choice was made that the boys would go to school. So these are real structural reasons why um, um, parents are making these decisions. We found very often that a lot of the girls who were at school were over age, which was a, had a real impact later on in life, and also that many had low self-esteem in terms of what schooling would do or their own ability to, when they started school. Um, then I think, again, reiterating earlier themes, sadly, violence has come out stronger than a lot of the program, who, people who design some of the programs we're supporting had, to, had to, some minimum interventions about school-based violence, but having done the baseline, realised that we need to do more, and particularly to and from school. I think many of you, real, you know that, but we have got some really strong evidence to show that's a particularly vulnerable time and speaks for, for school buildings to be as close as possible to where the girls are living. In one example, 95% of the girls girls in, in school um, experienced violence at some point. Um, then just, just the, the third point um, is on learning outcomes. Um, we, this program isn't a just an access program, it's about girls learning and that's our target, up to a million girls with improved learning outcomes. And we found that the, the learning levels are, with this group, extremely low. Um, and we have, I think I've, I've circulated one slide that hopefully everyone has a copy of, which shows how that actually gets worse the longer that girls are in school. So girls start at maybe one year or so um, behind the US average of a, of a similar aged girl or a similar stage in education, lower primary. By the time to get, they get to upper secondary, it's between seven and nine years difference. Between. So in terms of the added value that school is giving to those girls, it, 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 it's fairly minimum. So we, this is a crisis that we need to do something about. Um, however, we are looking at attitudes within schools and very interesting on the gender norms around learning. A lot of um, girls in terms of this, that we've actually picked up some work on STEM subjects, so math, math as opposed to literacy. Girls are much less, um, there's much more attitudes amongst teachers that that's not an acceptable subject for girls to do. So we have, we have work to do within the classroom. And then just finally, um, we are working with dis disabled girls. Um, and we've actually translated some of the EGRA and EGMA tests so that they're accessible for um, girls who um, have a disability. And we have found, again, um, that because of the, their experience in school hasn't been that empowering, the lab, some of the girls didn't even, couldn't even attempt the test, 70% um, of them in one case for the literacy and 59% for the maths test. So we also need to think when we're doing the learning metrics task force and others to make it as inclusive as possible for all groups of children. I'm going to 
Let's shut that very good. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Sally. Thank you very much. Um, Lucy, Lucy Lake is the CEO of CamFed International, which you, if you don't know, you'll have the benefit of hearing some about now. Over the past 50, or 50. 50. <laughs> <laughs> Over looking, the past 20 years, <laughs> has, <laughs> has led the development of CamFed's programs to become a recognized model of investment in girls' education. Lucy took up the position of CEO in 2012, having previously been director of programs and deputy executive director. Lucy's a founding member of the Global Advisory Committee of the UN Girls' Education Init Initiative, UNGAI, and has represented CAMFED as co-chair. Lucy, Lucy also represents CAM CAMFED on the Learning Metrics Task Force of the Brookings. So she's much more than that, and let's hear about it a little bit. Um, quick question for you to start, Lucy. What is the real value of secondary education for girls? Uh, we had the question earlier uh, over the Twitter uh, when boys are the ones getting the opportunities to capitalize on their secondary education. Why does secondary education matter so much for girls, and how do we get there? Right. Well, the real value of secondary education for girls, I'll talk to that from my 20-plus years experience, <laughs> Josh, not 50. Um, well, the benefits of girls' secondary education, I think, are well known, so I'm not going to dwell on those here because I think everyone here will be familiar with those. I mean, educate girls and you change the world, so the saying goes. But I think we have to be wary that we're often putting girls in the role as change makers and putting the burden on their shoulders at times when we say that, which I think we have to be cautious about. So in looking at the value of girls' education, I want to go down a slightly different route. Um, and to look at if we're going to transform girls' prospects as a result of secondary education, then we're going to need to shift their context. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, when girls come out from secondary education, they do face a kind of abyss, mm -hmm. um, an abyss in which the only choices or options may be marriage and motherhood. It may be expectations around being a breadwinner, which can render them very vulnerable if they then go to town and look for work where they are vulnerable to exploitation. So we have to, if we're going to get the real value of secondary education, we do have to look at shifting girls' context. And that comes down, I would say, to the how of delivery of support for girls' secondary education. And I'm going to touch on three issues around that, accountability, quality, and transition. Um, so coming first to accountability, at secondary level, there are, you know, to the point from on Twitter, there are higher levels of resources involved. Girls are that much older, the risks become that much higher. And just to illustrate that, I wanted to quote a young woman from Ghana, um, Mama, and what she said to the now UN Special Envoy for Education. She said, if you go to a secondary school and you see that the most beautiful girl has a bursary, you have to ask the question, why? Most likely it is because she is paying for that bursary through sex with someone in authority. And we have to ask that question. And we have to ask, do girls feel entitled to be in secondary school or do they feel indebted to whoever has supported them to get there? Do girls at secondary school feel entitled to get good marks, or do they feel indebted to the male teacher who has awarded them those good marks? Building that sense of entitlement of girls in secondary school is absolutely critical. But in tandem, we have to ensure absolute accountability over the resources being mm. allocated on behalf of girls. And I think that if we can get the stewardship of resources right on behalf of girls, then we can create the context in which their entitlements are protected and are respected. And that does come down to how we engage communities around girls' secondary education. How do we bring the duty bearers and the rights holders together? Because bridging that gap between home and school is absolutely critical. And it's a wide gap at secondary school level, both because of the distance of schools from girls' homes but also because their parents, more often than not, have not gone through to that level of secondary education. So that distance is wide, and that distance exacerbates girls' vulnerability. 
we have to look at making sure there's a critical mass of girls going through secondary school so that the issues that they're facing are brought into focus, that they are magnified. And we have to ensure that all those who are in authority in relation to girls are brought together to look through her eyes in order to dismantle the problems that impede her success going through secondary education. And picking up on the issue of quality, which um, Sally raised, I, mean, I do believe that the experience of the poorest, most marginalised girl is an important barometer for the education system because she will be the first to fail in a system that fails her. But if we can push up standards to the extent that she can succeed, then that will signal an assurance of quality for all. And in our work under the Girls' Education Challenge, we have been running national assessments to track the progress of learning of girls and boys at secondary school level, and then bringing those results to ministries of education and unmasking the data around what is happening to marginalised rural girls. And the results are shocking in terms of the level of results that they are achieving. But I think what's also in some ways more shocking is the results that we're seeing in the assessment that we ran alongside that about girls' um, attitude towards learning and the devastating disbelief that they have in their own ability to learn or even a, a sort of sense of entitlement to achieve. And I think, again, we need to recognise that these issues do go, go beyond the school gate and that how people are engaged around supporting girls and the psychosupport, psychosocial support is critical. And just thirdly on um, transition, I think looking at the framework of transition for girls on from <coughs> secondary education and into their communities is very important. And again, that's why the how of engaging, girl, of engaging communities around girls' secondary education is so important. Because if you've got that engagement right, then girls are progressing on from school into an environment in which um, they do have access to advice and support from local authorities, in which communities do have a vested interest in seeing their success. I think some of the results that we're seeing as a res as, you know, in, in light of that process is not just in the success of girls themselves, but it is, is in the level of resources that is now being leveraged within those girls' communities in order to support children lower down the system. For example, in Tanzania, where we looked at last year, in communities where girls had been engaged around supporting girls through secondary education, there was a 1,000% higher level of contributions from within communities mm -hmm. to support other children in the, those communities to go through the school system. Um, in our programme alone last year, 160, more than 167,000 children got support over and above what we provided for girls to go to school. So I think if you can get the process right, you can unlock, unlock far more resources to support girls and boys, not just through secondary school, but lower down the system through primary level. And of the girls who are completing secondary education, more than 72% of them are now themselves supporting other children in their schools to go, other children in their communities to go to school. But they are not doing that as lone change makers in their communities. Because if you get the process right, then they are part, they are leaders in a wider movement around education. Mm -hmm. And there are 24,000 of these young women currently in this, this network of school graduates through our programme. And that number is set to grow to over 100,000 over the next few years. And these are young women who are now leaders at the forefront of a wider social movement, not as lone change makers mm -hmm. in their communities. And I think that's key. Very good. I, th I think that's what I'll ask you about next. Well, let's move on to Aaron right now. Thank you, Lucy. Um, Aaron Murphy Graham is a faculty member in the Graduate School of Education at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, her research interests include education and, and empowerment, alternative secondary education, and program evaluation. Having written extensively on these, based uh, especially on research she's done in Central America, Honduras, and other places. Currently working with an interdisciplinary team studying the effects of sports-based job training program, a ganar, in Honduras and Guatemala. And in addition to teaching at UC Berkeley, Aaron has worked as a consultant for the Inter-American Development Bank, the Caribbean Development Bank, USAID, and as we've all learned, DFID. <laughs> 
So Aaron, a quick question for you that hopefully uh, relates to what you want to talk to us about. <laughs> <laughs> in many countries we're seeing, as we've heard, great gains in girls schooling at the primary and secondary level, and even with girls outperforming boys uh, in testing and in achieving tertiary level in many countries. Mm -hmm. Why isn't this an unmitigated success story? Mm. That's a great question. Thank you so much. And thank you all so much for coming today. It's a great pleasure to be here. Why isn't, why isn't it a success story, an unmitigated success story? So I, I, I do believe that part of why we should, um, or why we are convening today is to, is to celebrate some successes. And, and I do see evidence of change. And not just change in terms of women's attainment in different spheres, but change in terms of the way people view gender, the way people think about the roles of girls and women in society. So Josh, you mentioned that I'm doing a study uh, looking at an innovative sports-based program called Aganar in Honduras and, uh, and in Guatemala. And as a researcher, I often interview, right? I, I primarily conduct interviews. And in these interviews with youth, particularly with young males, I was actually struck over and over again with just how progressive their thinking is around gender. They, kept saying that, oh no, these values are machista values, and these are old values, these are not my values. Um, I kept trying to make the interview questions harder and you know, more challenging, but, but really, I'm, I'm so encouraged in talking with youth um, that, that change is happening. I think, that, though, that change can be very difficult to measure. Um, we don't really know how to, to get at these deep, deeply rooted belief systems. Um, and that change isn't happening across the board. So we may see more positive examples of change in terms of young generation, but we don't necessarily see that with um, people who themselves did not go through school. But I think there's agreement in thinking around education as being a powerful uh, tool to change society. Um, and at the same time, we have to really think about the fact that this whole movement to address girls' education and girls' underrepresentation in education came about because they were underrepresented. But in, in uh, uh, making schooling available, that doesn't necessarily change or address the root causes for why they weren't in school in the first place. So I think um, we need to think about how can change happen? How does change happen? Just broadly speaking, how does change happen in terms of uh, social change and social transformation? And when I think about it, I think about how we need two levels of change. We need to see change at the individual level. So I need to change the way I think. Lucy needs to change the way she thinks. Um, there has to be a capacity building and change with individuals. But we also need to see change in social structures. So we've talked about this as well. We can't have just individuals changing without the context in which they live changing as well. So education is really well suited to do this, right? Because we're indi educating individuals, but those individuals will go on to per perhaps form collective movements around these kinds of issues, as Lucy mentioned. <coughs> so, so I think we need to think about education and empowerment. And this is a term that we've heard, and it's a term that I've thought about quite a bit in my work. Um, just as we're seeing in the international education field, the idea of a paradigm shift to think about access to education, not just access, but access plus learning. I would say that in the field of gender and education, we also need to have a similar paradigm shift, where we're not just thinking about access, but access and empowerment. And so what does this word empowerment mean? Right? Because we hear it a lot. We think education leads to girls' empowerment. And in my research, I'm, I've tried to really unpack this. Um, and I've done that through this study of an innovative secondary education program that targets both males and females in rural areas of Honduras. Um, and, and so when I, what I've learned through this research and what I've um, come to understand about what does it mean for an individual girl or young woman to be empowered, um, the first step is the recognition of their inherent dignity. Okay, so, and this is, I think, also gets at what Lucy was mentioning about how girls don't believe they're entitled to education. They've, they've come to believe that they're inferior because the messages that they're getting from society are that they're inferior. So the first step is girls need to recognize their uh, inherent dignity and also their equality with others. The second step is for them to um, gain different types of capacities, and in particular, the capacity for critical thinking. And, and with that, also the critical thinking around gender issues. So girls need to come to develop a critical lens to view social relations in their communities, again, with this notion of equality in mind, so that they can, they can name gender equality. They can come to understand it. 
And then the third step is action. And this is also where we hear the term agency quite a bit, agency in terms of educating girls, improving their agency, improving their empowerment. Agency and action um, happen within cultural constraints, as we know. But the purpose of, of empowerment is not just for individual girls to think differently, but it's for them to be differently, right? For them to take actions towards both personal betterment and towards a collective betterment. So I think empowerment is a normative idea. Um, and, so, and then at the collective level, we think about empowerment as in terms of uh, challenges and the reshaping of power relations in political, economic, and social spheres. So before going on, I just want to pause here and say, why is it that we're talking about girls' empowerment, women's empowerment? I think we all know this. Um, but there has been this idea of like seeing a backlash around um, gender. In fact, just the other day, I was reading this really interesting article in the New York Times that was a call for more women to be coaches, saying that women in the United States had benefited from Title IX and we all played sports. Um, and so more women should now be coaches and should be leaders, right? Another, team, uh, another theme that we're thinking about here is leadership. And one of the comments in the, you know, that the readers sent in was that they're so tired of the New York Times reporting around gender. And isn't this like over? Isn't this done? You know, so this backlash is also not something that's unique to some other country, but within our own country, that you know, the gender issue is over, or oh, we're so tired of hearing about this. And I think one of the reasons why this backlash is happening is because we have forgotten that it's a gender equality issue, right? That this is not an issue about women coaches or about girls in schools. This is about how do we come to live in a society that is um, characterized by the principle of gender equality. And, and that, I think, we need to really keep in mind. And so in terms of um, why, how do I understand this? We, we have a gender lens, but we need to target adolescent girls. Um, and, and we should. We should target adolescent girls because they're much more vulnerable in this age of adolescence. They're far more likely to um, get pregnant. And the consequences for them are very different from the consequences for adolescent males who are impregnating. Okay. Um, however, I do think we need to open up even that whole field of when we think about early marriage or adolescent pregnancy, there are often two people <laughs> involved, right? Um, the vast majority of the time. Uh, so, so we need to think about these issues as really gender issues, not as girls' issues. Um, and then the other thing that's the reason why we target adolescent girls is because we know that their, their transition, as Lucy's saying, is much more challenging. So what do they do when they finish school? What options are available to them other than becoming housewives and becoming mothers? And I think livelihoods is one thing, but I would argue that we need to open up the thinking around livelihoods to not just think about it as, as paid work. Paid work is very, very important, but also other meaningful and important ways in which girls can be meaningfully engaged in society. And that can be through really important um, service opportunities. Service learning has been identified as something that's potentially um, very powerful. And to, so to think, really open the box about livelihoods. Um, so, so what does it mean, sort of in some, what's an empowering education for girls? How can we foster the empowerment process through education? Think about it in terms of core values and competencies. So the core values are dignity, equality, and action. Right? The education has to foster this among, uh, among girls and among boys. And then second are competencies. And with terms of competencies, I would say that there's, there's four of these that I've thought of. Um, and those are knowledge and critical thinking. So girls have to get access to knowledge and gain those critical thinking skills. Then they gain personal competencies. So some of this is self-awareness and thinking about what are my own personal habits and dispositions. And here is where I would put knowledge of reproductive health and reproductive rights. Um, I think this, should, this needs to be part of the curriculum at the secondary level. Again, it's going to be challenging, but it is so very important. Um, social competencies, there's been much more attention to the social and emotional benefits of schooling and education. And then finally, productive competencies. And by that, I mean, again, not only can they produce goods and services to be uh, integrated into the economy, but can they produce social change? Can they be involved in collective efforts, uh, be it the women's movements or other movements within their societies to begin to transform and improve them? So in terms of moving forward with the research agenda, I think we need to, to also identify positive examples of change and to get to study those more, because we know about the horrific things that have happened. Um, and those are off, often, we need to understand why those things happened. But we also need to understand why it is that the men that I speak to in Guatemala, why they have progressive ideas about gender. Where did they learn these? Did they learn them in school? Did they learn them in their family? Did they learn them in the media? So we know what helps to get girls into school. Um, and I think the literature review was a really important um, sort of confirmation of some of the things that have improved access. But now, how do we change mindsets? 
Um, how do we create different kinds of contexts for girls? And how do we also rethink what, what education means? We, when we talk about quality education, it doesn't always have to be the same kind of formal education that, um, that has come to be known as sort of modern schooling. So there are exa cost-effective examples of high-quality schooling that I think we can learn quite a bit from. So thank you. Thank you, Erin. Um, I'm going to take prerogative, moderator's prerogative, and ask each of the panelists a quick question for a quick answer so that we can get to the folks out there who I'm sure have many and even more intelligent questions. <laughs> but uh, Sally, DFID's working at the big macro level in trying to find quote unquote solutions for uh, girls schooling, but engaging partners to do this that take them deep down into the weeds. How do you do the sort of research that you're trying to uh, conduct with all these different initiatives in countries around the world and not whitewash the fine details mm -hmm. that um, I think Lucy's talked a little bit about, I'll ask her a little bit more, that are at the core of the sorts of solutions that uh, really show promise for carrying things forward at the local level. Okay, no, I think that's a good question. I think, that, I mean, the benefit as you know, the Girls' Education Challenge isn't sort of business as usual for, for DFID. I mean, most of our work um, prior to that has very much been working and supporting national governments and they're behind their education sector plan. And we still feel that's fundamentally important um, and that needs to carry on going. The reason we, we did the Girls' Education Challenge was because, um, you know, that classic, it wasn't reaching the parts <laughs> that we needed to reach. Basically, marginalised girls weren't being reached by traditional support. So um, I think, and on answer to your question, I suppose we're, we're lucky in the sense that we will get the aggregate, mm -hmm. but we'll also get the, new, you know, we'll get the nuance and the detail because of our partner stories. I think the challenge, which I thought you were going to ask me, <laughs> is us being bold enough to tell people what hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. And because we're taking a lot of risks and doing things differently. Um, and bringing in this multi-sectoral approach, and a lot of it hasn't been done before. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to be the big learning, and we need to be brave enough to do that. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Um, Lucy, you mentioned agency, and you mentioned, uh, you touched at the end on your alumna, alumna network. And I'm wondering if you could speak just a little bit more on how you use that alumna network to generate the sort of agency uh, within the individual girls and to engage communities around uh, making the sorts of decisions that Aaron's referring to, uh, to be brave enough to get their girls and to take the decisions that they need to take to get their girls into school safely and maybe even talk a little bit about this agency and how it connects with the security issues of girls uh, being able to attend school. Uh, with confidence and to have the chance to succeed there. Um, just, I would actually, in that first point you made about how do we use that agency, mm -hmm. I think it's actually always about turning that around. Mm -hmm. How do those young women use us? Mm. Because I think for us it is always about who do we consider to be the experts in charge of defining the response here and always turning that around mm -hmm. so that we are coming in behind that expertise. And that's why I think we have had the success in scaling up a local, locally led and defined mm. program because the expertise is recognized as being among those who are on the front line and young women who are coming through the system are the experts mm. on the challenges that they face and what works. And so it is about putting them in the leadership position and finding innovative ways to enable them to play that role within their communities. And so I think one of the programs that we're currently um, massively scaling up is a system of um, learner guides whereby young women who have been through the school system become the mentors and support other young people coming through and open up new areas of learning, like around critical thinking, addressing these issues of attitude to learning and sense of entitlement and self-esteem. And in return, they gain access to no interest loans mm -hmm. through one of our partners, Kiva, um, in order to build their own businesses within their communities. So it's kind of 
tying up the economic assets right. with improving the educational assets within communities. So it's about putting people on the front line as the experts and then opening up those opportunities that can build back into education. And I think if we, we do that, um, that's when we can work together to uncover some of the largely invisible issues around abuse and vulnerability that need to be brought to the forefront. Mm -hmm. And when you have a critical mass of young women who've been through school, they can magnify that and bring new dimensions to understanding how that, that can be addressed. Yeah. And having the, you know, giving them the opportunity, creating context for them, they have the expertise, but to recognize that expertise and to deploy it in a meaningful way, you make me think of And give currency to it, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, know, you make me think of an experience that I was involved with in Ethiopia where abduction of girls with rape and forced marriage is part of the culture. And a teacher at a school had abducted a girl from another school. And the girls at that teacher's school went on strike and went to the headmaster and said, we will not go back to the classroom until that teacher returns that girl to her, her family. So taking this, the, having the confidence and to act on the expertise that they have and uh, to bring it into a, you know, confront authority with it. Mm. Thank you. Um, Aaron, talking about, you mentioned the backlash and you mentioned empowerment. And I don't believe this is the case, but I think that several people see power as a mm -hmm. zero sum game. Mm -hmm. And when girls are getting more power, boys are getting less. Mm -hmm. When wives or mothers are getting more power, men and husbands perceive themselves getting less. How, how do you deal with the men and boys in the programs, or how have you observed the men and boys in mm -hmm. the programs that you're, um, mm -hmm. that you're studying mm -hmm. engage with this, yeah. this uh, new dynamic? That's a great question, because I think it's true that when we talk about empowerment, we often even forget to define what we mean by power. What is power? Um, what is powerful? And there are different schools of thought around what power is. And um, the feminist thinking around power is this idea of power with, not power over. Um, so when people come together, that's where we see power, power being most effectively executed. Um, and then also we think about what are the forces in society that are powerful. And um, you know, thinkers like Bell Hooks or other, I think, leading feminist thinkers often describe that love is a much more powerful force than domination. Um, and so thinking about how to tap these powers. And when we think about it with that in mind, we recognize that the current system of, of gender and current system of patriarchy also limits men from reaching their full potential, right? So men are denied the experience of being able to, for example, demonstrate love to others, um, to fully uh, access their deep emotions, for example. Um, you know, when a, when a man cries on television, it still makes news. Right? And, and that, that shows you that, that, you know, that men also stand to benefit, I think, from thinking around these things as a gender equality issue because currently women are denied opportunities, but men are also denied opportunities. And so in terms of the work that, that I have done um, and some, some specific examples, I think that there are um, really interesting and powerful mechanisms to, uh, that seem to be sort of like very transformative in nature. Right? So how do we think about the types of interventions that can be very powerful. And how do we make sure that schooling, quality schooling, has these types of opportunities? So I became interested in sports for this reason. Um, and think about how sports can be one potentially powerful mechanism. I think also we've seen some rec recent research um, uh, from a, a very interesting collaboration um, between um, India and Oakland, California, where we see technology and um, the use of technology, and uh, in particular, the use of um, creating small um, video stories can also be a very transformative and powerful experience for girls and um, males. And again, I mentioned service learning. I think this is where the idea of action and agency is so important, because it's only through taking action and through doing something, through active education, um, that it can be very, very powerful and very empowering. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, some of you know the Aga Khan Foundation. It's, it's been very interesting and rewarding for me to work for a foundation where the leader, the Aga Khan, actually the Aga Khan's current, the current Aga Khan's grandfather in the early 1900s told his community, the Ishmaeli 
sect of the Shia Muslims, that if you have a son and you have a daughter, and you only have the resources to send one of these children to school, send your daughter. So you, I'm working for an organization that uh, epitomizes what true leadership around this issue can mean. And when I travel to parts of the world where there's a strong Ismaili presence, thinking northern Afghanistan as an example, you see how this guidance makes a significant difference in how parents, families, communities perceive the education of their daughters in settings that are still very traditional as regards male roles and female roles. But with this direction from on high, um, it's not a matter of do I send my daughter to school, it's a matter of working with the communities to create the conditions that they feel provide the sort of security, uh, not just uh, physical security or personal security, but cultural, social, and emotional security to be able to make these decisions. So it's just, it's, it's interesting that uh, what we're dealing with is a matter of choice, social choice, cultural choice, and people make a wide array of choices, and making choices within communities don't always put you in the norm. Um, we have about 25 minutes if we gain, if we're given the five minutes we lost by starting late, we have a half hour for open questions. I invite you to submit, que uh, to pose questions. If they're general questions, do so, and we'll take them as we feel we have an answer. Um, if you have a specific question, please identify the person to whom you wish to ask the question. And if you have a comment, please feel free to make your comment. Whether it's a question or a comment, please be brief so that we have the maximum opportunity. I see a hand here, I see a hand way back there, here, and did I see a little hand here? Okay, we'll start here, here, and here, and be brief. We'll take three or four, and then we'll start another round, and I'll get my tweet questions as they come in. Please introduce yourself to- Thank you. Uh, Richard Rowe, Open Learning Exchange, out of Cambridge, Mass. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Graceland Girls, but it's a movie about a girls only secondary school in Kenya uh, where everything that you're talking about is being taught. And uh, it's really an inspiring movie. My question is twofold. What do you think about girls only schools? Mm -hmm. And second of all, um, what happens to these girls with all these visions about their future when they leave school? Mm -hmm. Okay, way in the back I saw a hand. Hi, um, I'm Yasin Choi. And um, since I came, I came a little late, but I've been hearing about education, and I want to know what type of education are we talking about when we're talking about girls' education? Because from the part of the world I come from, we have girls that are 15, that are seven, that start going to school when they're seven, but what happens to those that are 15 and didn't have the chance to go to school? So I think when we talk about education, most of the time we should emphasize on informal education because we do not live in a Western world all over the world. There are some parts of the world that are still not at the point where developed countries are. So when we talk about girls' education, I believe we should emphasize as much on informal education. So girls that are 14 and um, 12 will get a chance, or even 19, to make themselves better women and contribute towards uh, a better world. So I want to know how best you're working towards encouraging informal education in this part of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jenny? Uh, Jenny Perlman with the Center for Universal Education. Thank you to, for all, to all the panelists for a very um, interesting, informative discussion. I have a quick two-part question, which isn't related, but I'm calling it two parts so I can get them both in. Um, my first one is, um, I just wanted to follow up, um, Sally, on your very um, candid remarks about some of the challenges that you face, in particular around sharing um, some of the, what hasn't worked um, from the Girls' Education Challenge Fund. And my question is, is to you, but also to others, what do you think, there's quite a bit of interest in learning from what hasn't worked. Oftentimes there's in fact more to learn from that, right? And so the question is, how can we help put the right incentives in place so that DFID and others can share some of those, some of those 
what hasn't worked failures. The second part question is, um, the evidence has shown that poverty matters, as you shared, Sally, and that um, bursaries, stipends, scholarships have proven to be quite effective in at least getting girls into school, the jury's perhaps still being out on the learning front. Um, my question is, is we're thinking quite a bit about the, the issue of scale here at the Center for Universal Education. Is that model scalable? I know CAMFED in particular has quite a bit of success in it with scholarships, and my question is for you, Lucy, or to any of the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, one more right here. Good morning. It's absolutely a great uh, honor to be here. First time I'm here. And uh, my name is Augusto Bejar. I for, uh, well, I'm a summer intern for BizLAC, the Latin American Center for Business Development. My question is, well, I'm very interested when it comes to male engagement. Uh, when it comes to girls' education. So my question is to all of you um, about um, if you could give us like some details of how to build, for example, a successful or at least a very stable program on how to make, uh, especially young boys who have absolutely greater potential to be changers in the future uh, when it comes to improving the situation of girls in education. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, Aaron, do you want to take a couple of those? Sure, sure, I'd be start? happy to. There were such wonderful questions. Thank you all so much. Maybe I'll go, if you don't, don't mind, it might be easier for me to go in reverse order. Um, so in terms of the, the male engagement question, um, there are a number of very innovative programs that, um, that uh, engage boys and campaigns. I think the media is a really interesting strategy to do some of this, but the, the, um, the group that I would turn your attention to is called Instituto Promundo. Is anyone here from Promundo today? OK, I think maybe they're joining tomorrow for some discussions. But they uh, are a Brazilian-based um, NGO that's now gone international that works uh, with um, different types of um, interventions to, to essentially reach out to men and boys around issues related to HIV prevention, violence, um, and also around um, changing gender norms, more broadly speaking. So they are a really interesting and important resource. And I agree wholeheartedly with this idea that we need to think about how to more effectively engage men so that they become, can become allies uh, in this, and boys as well. Um, with a question about learning from, uh, about what hasn't worked um, and, and the scale issues, um, I think uh, with regards to, I'm going to let Lucy actually speak to the scale issue, but with uh, learning what, with, from what hasn't worked, um, I think there's a, a little bit of an evaluation problem too. Um, so we, we are, are, I think there's an increasing use of impact evaluations, and I think to, to some extent that's a good thing. Um, but with regards to gender, we have a, a little bit of a challenge with regards to how we're even thinking about or measuring change. Um, so I think that there's just, we're still at really early stages of sort of thinking about how do we evaluate gender impacts. Um, and uh, so I think it is important to document cases where things haven't worked. But I think, again, it's, um, we have to think about looking at transformative experiences, even if the scale is small. And we have to do sort of in-depth qualitative work to basically understand and illumine the pathways of change. With regards to the formal and informal question, I, I don't know if and you Josh, don't have to don't address them all. Okay. Just the ones I'll, that I'll just stop there, and then maybe if others want to jump in, and, and then I, if, if something hasn't been answered, I back. can come back. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. We'll see. <laughs> Just to pick up on a couple of those then, and Jenny, to your point around um, scaling, I think, the, and, and bursaries, I think the issue is at secondary level, the costs are not going to go away overnight. So the issue of additional support to enable girls to enroll and complete secondary education is always going to be there. So finding models through which that support can be provided, and in our case, um, it was to set out to prove that you can scale a locally driven model but to do so in partnership with ministries of education because we are working with the system and looking at ways in which you can embed those processes in the system. So I think that partnership with ministries of education in scaling is absolutely, I and mean, it goes without saying, is fundamental. And um, to pick up on the issue of um, the kind of non-formal education, mm -hmm. which relates, I think, to some of the points you were raising, Richard, and, and at the back. Um, I mean, I think this issue also relates to looking at the relevance mm -hmm. of education and to your point about what happens to girls beyond school. And I think this is a critical issue for us to look at. But it's not about us putting 
to one side formal education and looking at alternatives. I mean, in our case, looking at the issue of girls being included within a system, I think the psychological impact of being excluded from the system is something that has devastating consequences. The reason why CAMFED is focused on bringing girls into the secondary education system as well as through primary level is because, you know, coming back to an experience I had of the justice system in a country in sub-Saharan Africa where that justice system wrote off extreme forms of gender violence as being down to the high spirits of young men. Mm. And I realised in that that it was not necessarily that the justice system or the people orchestrating it were at fault, but there was no woman in that justice system. And as long as there was no woman in that justice system, how could laws be set and upheld that really took account of the devastating consequences of abuse against women? And if you take a step back and see that there are no women in the education system, and a further step back and see that there are no girls coming through the school system, then you realise you are never going to change those systems. Mm -hmm. gonna, girls and women are never going to feel that those systems are working for them. So I think the fact of inclusion in the formal system is a critical starting point, but then recognising that for many, there is not that opportunity. But it is how do we make that, those non-formal opportunities complementary to, rather than alternative to, formal education? Thank you, Lucy. Sally, you had a question to you directly? Yes, yeah, I will I'll come on to that one. I just wanted to follow up a bit for the question on the back as well, because I think that was a really important point about um, age and the assumptions that we make when we discuss about education. And I suppose those of us in the room who are quite potentially more familiar with different countries' education systems and also the fact that children go at different ages, that's not necessarily the case for, um, for a sort of Western audience who tend to think primary starts at sort of five or six and then at 11 years old, um, children go on to secondary school. And, and that just isn't the case, as we know. Many, many girls are still at primary school when they reach adolescence. And I think it's really important that we don't forget that. I mean, so I, it's so important to talk about secondary here, but, but there are a lot of adolescent girls in primary. So um, I think Cathy's gone now, but I think that's a really important message when we look at the adolescent girls piece. So thank you for raising that point. Um, on, on the failure, yes. I mean, I think... Um, I'm not quite sure what the question was, but just yes. I mean, we'll try. I mean, we are we're incentives. I mean, I think there's incentives. I mean, obviously, um, I work for a government, and 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 behind that, I suppose my responsibility is to the UK taxpayer. So to a certain extent, you know, that we have an incentive <laughs> to say that things are working really well. So I think there is, you know, I think it's a really challenging question. We, what we're trying to do with the programme I'm working on is to make sure I went right from approval process and all the way through to be very open about the risks we're taking, to have a clear, you know, risk mitigation strategy. So we're actually saying, are you sure you're okay if we, you know, if we say that this isn't working or that we need to pull a program? So we're trying to bring. So that's, I mean, that's just an institutional way of doing things. Um, I think in terms of broader things about the design of the program, I hope, but Lucy can give me direct feedback and others in the audience that we've listened and learned, and we did certainly get things wrong at the beginning. Um, but it's a, we hope we listen to people who know what they're talking about in the front line. Um, where within parameters. So I think it's a learning process. And in terms of lesson learning for projects, it's not necessarily cutting the funding. It's actually giving people an extra period of time to redesign their program. And as donors, we need to get better at that. So, and, and I hope we've got an example here. We've, we've extended our program by a year just over the last month, just for that reason. Um, okay, sure. thank you. I'd like to address the, the male engagement uh, question very quickly. Uh, a colleague at, I think she's at University of Kenya, it's either that or Nairobi, Fatuma uh, Chege, whom some of you likely know, uh, does some very interesting research looking at boys and girls in schooling. And she has a, a brilliant slide uh, showing a project improved girls dormitory with bed nettings and cupboards for putting the girl's possessions and uh, all the fine beds, and next to it, the boys' dormitory, which is mats on the ground. Okay. 
And uh, another colleague, Nisha Stanford, talks about her work in southern Sudan before it became its own country. And all this investment in girls schooling with the boys getting nothing and the backlash that someone mentioned earlier, uh, the boys would go and uh, strip the clothes that these girls had gotten from, from the project off their backs. So the, the, it's gender equality, not girls' education, that we use in our rhetoric, and we need to remember that we're talking about gender equality. And that gender equality isn't just about boys and girls, it's about society and about communities. And the girls being educated bring value to the communities, the families, and to the men themselves, the men that they marry, their families, uh, uh, their neighbors and the rest. And what I've been trying to do with several of our uh, country projects is to engage this discussion from early on so that boys and girls are solving the problems of their schools, of their own lives, of their communities in a discussion to determine what each brings to the mix as a contribution that is inherent either to their gender roles uh, as opposed to their biological sexual uh, situations, and to what they share across the different gendered roles. Um, none of us answered your question about girls-only schools. We have our colleagues from Malawi here, and last night we learned from the ambassador that his wife attended a girls-only school, having, been, having shifted from a co-ed school. So perhaps, uh, Madam, you would be willing to share a little bit about your views to help us answer the question that none of us up here answered? Thank you. Well, I was just sharing that uh, I went to a co-ed uh, school that is many years ago. Some things have changed, but still I know challenges still remain in some parts. But when I went to that school, um, there were fewer girls than boys in the first place. And uh, most of the girls thought that they went to school because they needed to be in school and that uh, they really didn't think um, of the the, fu the future, like what, what education really can bring to their lives. I, I happen to have come from a family that was working in town. My mother was a teacher. Uh, my father was an accountant. And so that made a bigger difference in terms of uh, uh, the understanding of uh, the value of education between myself and the others. Um, I happened to have gone to a secondary school which was in a district where my dad came from. And uh, that was kind of a rural district. Most of the girl, girls had not been exposed to any uh, other, they had not seen the outside world. And so when they went to school, uh, it was like, um, we go to school because we've been asked to go to school, but they didn't have that view. And uh, having come from their parents who had not been educated themselves meant that they uh, the parents who did not have a role in helping them to understand what education was all about. So when I went to school, I was kind of uh, surprised the way uh, my, my, my colleagues were uh, performing in class. I was working very hard, having been advised by my parents that I needed to succeed. Um, somehow, um, at the end of uh, education, I mean, my, my husband shared yesterday, but uh, I, maybe I can share with you that when I went to that school, I was told by my, my, my peers that when you come to school, you need to have a boyfriend. And then because you are this, I went at 13. And I was really, when I went to high school, I was 13. And you can imagine at 13, you have come from your parents who have advised you that you are coming for education, and then some other people have different views, and they're telling you that you need to have a boyfriend. And uh, the story is that um, 
Uh, at my age, I, I decided to write a letter to my, father, my dad uh, to say, you know what, I've come to school to learn, but I understand I need to have a boyfriend. Uh, and, and I didn't understand that because I thought I'm, I'm coming to learn. Uh, but um, and uh, that, that really caused a lot of problems because my dad contacted the headmaster, uh, wrote a letter to the that, at that time we were no emails and so on, but he wrote a letter. It took some time, but the headmaster received the letter and the headmaster contacted the boarding mistress uh, that that was something was happening in the, in the dormitory that the people, the girls are being exposed to boys. And uh, that was a big thing uh, to the extent that uh, um, disciplinary action was taken. Um, uh, I was, I, and I was identified as the person who had actually revealed all that. Uh, but it saved us because then action was taken. Apparently, uh, apart from only that, because I worked very hard that year, out of about 50 students, well, 50 male students and uh, about 14 girls, uh, I was the only one who actually passed the junior uh, secondary education uh, uh, exams. The rest of the girls dropped out. Mm -hmm. At that time, the views were that girls go to school because they have to, they have to pass from primary to secondary, and that was it. And the, and the view was that once you get to that secondary, uh, uh, junior certificate, when you get junior certificate, you need to go back, and because girls need to go and do other things, while the boys had to continue. So I was the only one who actually came out of uh, uh, that school, and um, I remember that that was also the last year that that school had girls um, uh, admitted girls. We needed to, girls now, that school became just a boys' school, mm. and the girl, most of the girls who were coming were going to other schools. I went to a girls' only uh, school thereafter for my Form 4 and uh, Form 5, which is a, a, a higher um, okay. high school. Thank you. And my experience is that really most of the women in my country and uh, elsewhere in Africa are doing much better in girls only schools. Very good. Because Thank you very much. They get to yeah. I, I asked the question to 12th graders in northern Afghanistan, boys and girls. The girls said they appreciated being in girls only schools because they could concentrate on their studies and not be harassed by the boys. The boys said they thought it was more important for girls to be in high school because when they got with boys, because when they got to university, they would be with boys and they needed that practice. <laughs> um, several very good questions from the Twitter land of tweet. Uh, I'll read one of them and let whoever wishes to answer answer. In order to best educate girls, do we also need to educate teachers about educating girls? And I think that'll be our last question. So why don't you use this as an opportunity to answer the question and say whatever last thing you wish to say. <laughs> Sally, we can start with you. Oh, gosh, OK. I mean, the quick answer is yes. <laughs> um, right. You know, I, th I, I think we do. We certainly, um, uh, as we're picking up, it's what goes, on, the, 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 what goes on in the classroom is so critical in terms of teaching and learning, and the teacher is a key role of that process. And if they're not including any child in that process or um, in any way influencing a child's ability not to learn, <laughs> then that's a problem. So, of course, we need to, we need to do that. And we certainly do in the Girls in Challenge. We've got a lot of examples of gender-based pedagogy. We're evaluating it, and we will look at the impact of that vis-a-vis -vis just normal pedagogy and see whether it makes a tangible difference. So we'll have some evidence about that in three or four years' time. Good. That's it. We'll reconvene then. OK. Very good. Lucy? Um, well, short answer again, yes. Um, but I think that, that um, what's critical is not just about teachers focusing on girls performing, but it is about teachers being more attuned to the situation of marginalised young people in their classrooms, you know, the majority of whom are likely to be girls who are marginalised, but it is about being attuned to that and the problems that are impacting on their ability to participate in class and helping teaching teachers to find ways to bring that through, I think is going to be critical. And I think 
just to, to the last point, um, to thank CUE for really bringing this spotlight on to second generation issues because that you said at the start, Josh, you know, or Rebecca, maybe it was you, that many of us have been talking about these issues for years. And my God, if the spotlight moves off them now, mm. so we need to keep it on there. And I, so I think the fact that we, we have this spotlight on going forward is absolutely critical. Okay. Thank you, Lucy. Eric. Thank you. Yes, again, um, I, <laughs> I, I think we're unanimously agreed that teachers matter. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, we, we do need to learn more about how to do how to how to do this effectively, though, because I do think that it's 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 easy to move to sort of discourse around okay, boys and girls are equal. You know, they're, there's they're equal. But then what does that mean in terms of, OK, so if we think boys and girls are equal, we still have to realize that they're in a context that probably doesn't treat them as equal. Mm -hmm. So then do we need to do certain, do we need, we need to be very strategic, right, in terms of how we think about um, the school happening within a certain context and in relation to um, this transition issue, uh, transition to, to adulthood. And, um, and so the work with teachers will be really important. And I think we have a great deal more of learning to do about how we can do it most effectively. Very good. Thank you. I'm, OK, thank you. Um, great. Um, this has been a very rich discussion. I'm sure we could go on for many hours, but we won't, because we've got another rich discussion following after the break. I, to try to wrap up this enormously rich and diverse uh, set of interventions, we've been discussing this, as I said, for decades now. And I, I think we don't want to despair that we haven't solved it yet because, and I don't want this to sound pessimistic because I don't think we'll ever solve it. It's unfortunately going to be an issue that's going to require being under the spotlight for many decades to come. Um, I don't see men and women making a decision anytime soon that we are going to be and share all of our responsibilities. We're going to be a gender-free uh, society or world where men and women will be uh, e uh, completely interchangeable. Um, and biology explains part of that, but I think uh, science is going to make even that uh, not necessarily a, an excuse anymore. But we. The other reason I don't think we're ever going to solve it is that no one solution is going to be the silver bullet. Um, these are topics that we're going to have to continue to tackle at the very micro level, whether it be within a family household and a mother and a father, a husband and a wife, making decisions about how they uh, distribute the different responsibilities and roles, and then transforming these beyond the household uh, walls. But the sorts of research and sorts of initiatives that we're hearing about here and that we'll hear about later are vitally important to understand and understand why they're working when they're working, why they're work not working when they're not working, not to discard them because there are many good ideas that don't become good practice just at the first or second effort. Um, so we're really keen to hear what you all discover in the next three or four years at DFID and to hear how the different, your research evolves and with the different partners you're working on and how CAMFED takes our understanding to even new, newer heights um, as you address the, the future challenges that you'll be uh, addressing. So with that, I will thank our panelists and ask you to thank the panelists. I will thank you for your attention and your participation. Sorry that we didn't get to participate a little more. And I will invite you to a 15-minute break right out here. <laughs>